Hi. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I know it's one of the last talks, so most, uh, I'm glad that people will turn up. So thank you very much. Um, so today I'm going to start this talk on big data in action with Infinispan by uh, looking into the into problems that you have with real-time data and the data growth that we've seen. And then we see how Infinispan, which is an in-memory data grid, helps you solve those issues. Um, and finally, we see a bit of live coding. So you're going to see some demos, things in action. I've uh, been to a few talks. I haven't seen yet a demo. So I'm I think it's actually quite useful. And uh, I hope you have fun. So um, so before I go a bit more about myself, uh, my name is Galda. I work for Red Hat. Uh, I primi primarily work on Infinispan, which is an in-memory data grid platform that I co-founded in uh, uh, 2009. I currently lead the client server architecture, but I also kind of go out and speak about Infinispan and try to see, uh, try to spread the Infinispan love around. Uh, I'm particularly keen on uh, languages that promote functional programming. And uh, yeah, if you, you can find me on Twitter on AltGadderZ. Uh, if you have any questions or any comments to make about the presentation, you can hashtag Infinispan or be bus, uh, be bus um, hashtag from, from the conference. So before I carry on, I wanted to find out a little bit about yourself. So how many of you are Java developers? Right, only four. Uh, what about the rest? Are you Node.js developers, JavaScript, Python, Scala? OK, so all right. Uh, so if the Java people, how many of you have used Java 8 already? Yeah, okay, so most of them. OK, um, how many of you have heard about Infinispan before? Only just a couple. Okay. Um, all right. So let's get started. So the idea for today is um, I want to show you how you can build Infinispan-based infrastructure to store, um, search, and process data. Uh, what kind of data? Data that's kind of near real-time data. And I want to also show you how you can do some analytics even with uh, Infinispan. So why are we interested in dealing with this this type of data? Well. First of all, dealing with real-time data um, can be quite challenging. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of, uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot of like uh, mechanisms for dealing in offline and batch, uh, batching techniques, etc. But uh, dealing with real-time is becoming more and more popular. You've seen it with uh, Apache Flink and other similar projects. Um, and the, the reason why this is important is because even having a few delays or of a seconds of reacting to things can mean the difference between losing a customer or keeping it, or it can mean the difference between earning money or losing a lot of money. So in essence, uh, real-time processing can be quite crucial in your, in your for y depending on your use case. The other trend we've seen is that there is this huge exponential growth of data that is happening. Uh, smartphones have been, he have been here for 10 years and they're producing more and more data. IoT as well is becoming more and more present. So the idea is that we are seeing all this data that is being pushed or published or whatever. So how can we, ca what can we do? How can we analyze it? Okay. And our view or my view is that in memory data grids are very good solution for dealing with this kind of problems. Now, you might wonder what is an in-memory data grid. In-memory data grids are essentially a way to manage distributed data in memory. The idea is that you have certain servers or certain uh, nodes which use their own memory as a way to store the data. And they work in a kind of peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, a peer-to-peer -peer communication style. So it's not like a uh, zookeeper of us where you've got a master slave. Um, we we don't know none of that. We You've got uh, all the nodes are equal to each other, so there's no single bottleneck, there's n no single point of failure. And the idea of uh, in-memory data grids is that they are designed to run on community hardware. They're designed as well to be linearly uh, scalable. That is because they use la we use uh, smart data distribution techniques where we can say we want to keep n copies, one, two, three, four copies of the data, and then the cluster or the kind of the data grid itself knows how to keep that around. It spreads the data, so it uses consistent hash algorithms to, to do that. Um, so the idea is that each of the nodes is kind of owner of a subset of the data. So by doing that, we're getting this kind of implicit data parallelism going on. 
Um, of course, it is elastic, so you can add new nodes, you can destroy nodes, no problem. Uh, failure is handled transparently, so it means that it's a very good uh, solution for cloud or pass environments. Um, if you want, if your data is really, uh, if you want it to keep it for, for a long time, you can also back it up with a database, a persistent store, etc. Um, you can access it from any type of application, which means you can kind of um, s uh, have this kind of transparent data layer that is shared by all sorts of applications, from mobile applications, websites, custom applications, etc. And we have connectors available for Java, Node.js, C, C++, etc. So, in, in we could say that in the simplest form, in Finispan, which is an in-memory data grid, could be used as a distributed cache. Okay, the idea here is that you use a distributed cache to boost the performance of your application. Uh, typical examples would be if you have like something like Hibernate and you want to you retrieve something from the database and then you want to keep it in a cache so that afterwards you can retrieve more easily. Uh, but you could you could store all sorts of other things. You could store metadata, look up information, data coming from somewhere else, etc. Another way you can look at Infinispan it gives you like a kind of a simple, flexible way to store data without any schema. So it's kind of quite fluid kind of uh, data model, uh, where you can run rich queries. So you can, for example, alla Infinispan allows you to annotate the data that you store in Infinispan so that you can afterwards run Lucene queries, for example. So you can do this kind of rich queries uh, on them. Uh, they can also participate in transactions. Um, and obviously, they elastically, uh, these nodes, the power that you're using, they you can have them elastically uh, scale and recover from any issues. So for example, if you're trying to keep a, uh, some session information around, and then if there is a node failing, you can still continue doing it. You can also use it to kind of support event-driven computation. Uh, so we here the idea is that instead of you being the one that fetches the data, we push events to you whenever the data changes in the backend. Um, so the idea is to bring the processing closer to when the data the change is happening. And this is the kind of thing that is going to be very interesting for our talk today because it allows you to kind of do this kind of real-time um, kind of uh, analytics or computations. The final kind of use case is you can also do some data analytics with Infinispan. That is because uh, we've got two ways in which you can do analytics. The main one is by using um, Java Streams, which is uh, Java 8 Streams, which was a new Streams API that came in Java 8. And we've ex enhanced it to run in a distributed environment. But on top of that, we're also integrating with the Spark and Hadoop. So what does it mean to run Spark and Hadoop with Infinispan, it means that you get the benefit of having your data in memory and it's already clustered, you've got the data already partitioned, so you can kind of take advantage of the fact that data is already partitioned and you can run multiple job, jobs in parallel in all this data and then get it together. So it's quite, quite a powerful, powerful uh, thing. So the talk today is going to be focusing mostly on these two use cases, okay? And the first use case is going to be the event broker or real-time use case. Now, for this use case, um, the most important thing that we're going to be looking at is what we call continuous query. So if you want to talk to Infinispan, there are multiple ways in which you can communicate with it. You can, uh, you've got like a dictionary, key, key value-like API. We've got a querying API, which obviously I just said before, like you can have Lucene queries on top of it. But um, if we want to address the real-time use case, we need something a bit more advanced. So what the Continuous Query API allows us to do enables your application to be reactive to data changes. The idea is that uh, you execute a query and you get all the resulting matches for that particular query. And then as new data gets pushed into the data grid, you get, uh, you get notifications saying, hey, this new entry has joined the result set. Or for example, if some data is removed, then you get an event saying, hey, that particular data le left the, the result set. Um, so thi this is quite a powerful this is pa uh, quite a powerful tool. Now, this is all a bit abstract, so I think the best way to look at all these things is to actually 
look at a demo. So I've got a demo which kind of revolves around the topic of a uh, Swiss rail transport system. So this might sound very silly, but these are more or less the, uh, the, the kind of domain objects we're going to be using today. So we're going to have train object, which is train. So it's got like an ID and a type of train, etc. We're going to have uh, a station. So obviously a station with a name and then a location as well. And then for each station, we're going to have, uh, well, we, we'll look at it later. But basically, in the first time, we're going to have, oops, for each station, we're going to have a station board. So that is which trains are coming through, which platform they're going to be stopping at, etc. And then each of those lines here in the station board, we call it a stop. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to be running this demo today on top of OpenShift. How many of you know OpenShift? Know what it is? Okay. So. OpenShift is essentially Red Hat's platform as a service environment that allows you to quickly develop, host, and scale your applications. Um, you can run in a public environment on top of Amazon or, uh, or Azure, etc., or you can run it within your own, or your own organization. And it's, um, it's a platform that is designed for, to, for running all sorts of applications. So it can be from Java, Node.js, etc. Underneath, what it uses, it's based on Docker uh, for obviously the container technology and uses Kubernetes for the orchestration. On top of that, the application that we, the demo that I'm going to show today is going to be using Vertex. Anyone know what is Vertex? No, no one. Okay. So Vertex is, a, is a essentially, a oh, you do. Yay. <laughs> it's a toolkit for building reactive applications on top of the JVM. Um, it's event driven and non blocking, so it means you can take you can make better use of your um, resources and it deals with a lot of the concurrency for you. And you can access it from all, all sorts of languages as well, from JavaScript, uh, Java, Groovy, Ruby, Scala, etc. Now, here in the, ooh, that's very nice. That's the first time that diagram has appeared so well. So this is a little bit, I'm going to be running two demos. So the first demo is basically, this is what it looks like. Now. What we have here is, first of all, we're going to have OpenShift here. That's going to be our kind of container platform. And we're going to have a data grid. This data grid is going to be formed of three nodes, which are uh, which, use, um, which basically share the data. And then what is going to happen is when we uh, basically we have here an injector, a vertical. Vertical is kind of like an actor. Okay, this vertical means an actor for <laughs> so that you know for for vertex. This one is basically going to be taking about two hours worth of data from the station boards that we captured, and it's going to be feeding in into the data grid. Okay, um, it's going to be a speed up, so it's not going to be real time. It's about ten times the speed. Now, what do we want to do with it? The idea is we're going to be using here, we're going to have a continuous query vertical, which is going to say, hey, of all the station board data that are present, I want to filter by the, those trains that are delayed. Because what we're going to do in the front end is we're going to try to do create a little dashboard that shows us all the delayed trains happening around the country. OK? Um, and then, so what's going to happen is this uh, query, continuous query, whenever it gets a new entry, it's going to push it through a SOCJS bridge to this little HTTP endpoint. And that one is going to push it through WebSockets to a little JavaFX dashboard that I have in the front end. OK, is that understood? Yeah, right. So let's see this in action. So um, I've got this habit that I normally try to, instead of just showing things working immediately, I like to first show you how things are first before I do anything, and then you can see how, how it, things change, OK? Right, so um, let's go to my. So uh, oops, this is from something else. Yeah, yeah. OK, so uh, let's see. Oops. Oops. OK. Uh, be folks, before I do anything, uh, this is a little bit the FX app is the kind of the starting point of my uh, FX application. Now, the uh, application as is, the continuous query uh, vertical is not complete. So what happens is whenever I want to run this FX application, which I can just run it by, it's just a standalone application, what I'll get is I'll get my oops. oops. Uh, Yay. 
I get this little dashboard here. Let me sh oops. So I get this little dashboard here, which basically is empty. It's this is the, the dashboard that we're trying to, 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 to basically to fill it in. Okay? So at the moment, it's not showing anything. Not very exciting. Now, what is missing in our application? So what is missing is here we've got the uh, continuous query vertical. This is the vertical that we are going to kind of enhance to do what we want. So when we talk to the data grid here, we're talking to this kind of remote cache. Uh, and that's the one that basically is saying what we're trying to do is keep the state of the current station boards. So for each station, whether it's Basel, Zurich, or whatever, we this is the station board. Now, from the station board, what are we interested in? Um, we're mostly interested about, so as we said, each station board has got a list of uh, stops. And then what we're interested in is out of all the stops, those that have got a delay that is bigger than zero, because it means that they're delayed. Right? So what we need to do, we get back to our continuous query vertical, and then, OK, we know what the station boards look like. Now we need to say, we need to create uh, our query, first of all. So for that, in InfiniSpan, you've got a query factory where you can say, I want to query from all the station boards that are there. And then I'm going to be saying, I want to have an expression where it says, of all the station board entries, I want to do those that delay, the whose delay minute is greater than zero. And then I just build. Okay, so I've, I've got the query. This is enough for me to say which are all the delayed trains that are at the moment. Now, the other part I need to do is I need to also add the listener. This is the listener that is going to be invoked whenever there's a new entry, uh, a new station board um, that contains uh, delayed entries. So what's going to happen is um, if you look here, what I'm getting is what I'm, my query said, OK, if I have a station board of 10 entries, whenever there is any entry that is delayed, I'm going to get it feed, uh, um, kind of pushed into this, um, into this listener. So here I need to do a little bit of filtering, because what happens is I'm going to get them all, the entries. But uh, of all the ones I know of this station board, I want the ones only whose each of the st uh, which the stop is delayed. Okay, so I'm doing kind of a little extra filtering on the station board, okay? And then what I do is afterwards I need to do for each of those entries, I need to take that and I need to push it to the event pass. So underneath publish delay, this method basically is the one that takes care of pushing it to the event pass, okay? That's going to underneath send it to the SOC jailbreak. Now, I've got the query, I've got the listener. What do I need to do next? Put the two together. So I can say continuous query dot add continuous query listener. So there I marry the two. So I put the query and the listener together. Boom. Right? Now what I need to do next is I need to push these changes onto the uh, into the the OpenShift. There are multiple ways to do it. Uh, there's like, uh, you can push them directly through Maven. You can push them, uh, they can listen for your Git repository, any changes. So then it pushes the changes. Uh, in my case, I'm kind of doing a mix. I'm doing, um, hold on, oops, 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 hello. Why is it going so weird? So long. Oops. So, yay. Yeah, yeah. So, oops, you don't see the, well, never mind, that's not really. So what we're going to do is we're going to time, uh, we're going to basically push it. Uh, the way we can do it is I can say, just build the new continuous query uh, vertical. I can just, just ask Maven to, to build it. And then if we go to here, uh, you can see the, uh, ma this is what the console for OpenShift looks like. So you should see in a minute, how well, at the moment I just built it, okay? So what I need to do is um, I need to start a new build with the binary that I'm going to say it. And the one way I can do that is I can say OC start build, and then I can say, hey, um, I've got like a little Docker file that points to the binary. I can say push this new binary over to, to OpenShift. So this is what I'm going to execute. And now we still see like the starting to run the build, uh, to run it. And you should see our change happening. So it's, it's changing. Hey, excellent. Yeah, OK, so it's, it's deployed this new, this new artifact. 
So now what is left to do is just to show if our demo actually works. So if we go back to our RFX application, we just need to start it up. And let's see what happens. So we see a little transport. So we start seeing trains appearing. So we see like uh, we've got some trains that are starting to get delayed. They're getting pushed through the container via SockJS over to us. Okay, and then we start getting more and more delays. So you see, whoever tells you that trains are not delayed in Switzerland is lying. Okay, you've you've got the proof now. Okay, right. Uh, how am I doing with time? Twenty minutes. Excellent. Right. So let's get back to our. Um, uh, let's get back to our presentation. Yay. Oops. Right. So for the first part, I want to focus on the doing uh, data analytics. Um, now, as I said, um, with InfiniSpan, there are two possibilities of doing analytics. The first one is you can use uh, InfiniSpan or with Spark or Hadoop with an InfiniSpan backend. Now. If you are here, I'm sure you know of a Spark or Hadoop. I mean, you, you, this 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 uh, this conference seems to have a lot of people that, are, and a lot of uh, people that are very interested in data. So I won't uh, say too much about it. What I can say is that I think it is a very powerful combination between instead of pushing your data over to HDFS or whatever, putting it into InfiniSpan can give you certain interesting characteristics because. Um, you already have your data pushed in a cluster of nodes, so you can kind of take advantage of all the different nodes running the, 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 the jobs in, in parallel. Um, now, the problem with Spark or Hadoop uh, is that in general, there are big technology stacks. They require their own resource management. Uh, they have separate clustering based on Zookeeper, I think it is. Uh, so they're very powerful, and I, I think they're very useful. Uh, so, but um, you should use them when you really need them. So what is the alternative? Um, when um, One of the things you can do with InfiniSpan is you can, we've extended the Java 8 Extreme API that is available since uh, Java 8, and um, we've made it, enhanced it so that you can run in a distributed environment. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that um, when you want to, you can kind of look at an InfiniSpan as a collection and you can run uh, filter, map, flat map operations. And whenever you, you pass in a lambda, that lambda is going to underneath be shipped around to all the nodes and it's going to run locally. So if, if for a particular node, where uh, for a particular data, there's always one node which is the owner. So that the owner is going to be running the lambda for that particular data. And then another node is going to run the lambda for another da data that he owns. So it means it can kind of take advantage of the fact that data is already partitioned and then send the lambdas around. Obviously, this is a very powerful concept because it means that we don't have to be shipping the data around. It's only like the lambdas or the functions, which are, which are a lot smaller. Now, I, to to see this in action, I wanted to kind of um, use. Uh, I want to show you how to use a distributed data stream to answer this particular question. What is the time of the day when you get the biggest ratio of delayed trains in Switzerland? Now, let's do a little round. Who thinks that is uh, midday? Okay, no one. Who thinks that is uh, five o'clock in the in the evening? Okay. Who thinks it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning? Who thinks it's uh, midnight? Okay, well, let's uh, le let's have a look. Uh, it's a, it's an unobvious thing to to answer. Now. Again, I've got a little demo. Oh, I love this. This, this, uh, this, um, this uh, screen is amazing. I can actually see things. Um, so what we have is a very similar setup before, it's a s but it's slightly changed up. So I've got uh, still my container. I've got three InfiniSpan nodes. And what we have here is we've got an InfiniSpan data grid node. And on top of that, what I do is I've got uh, what we call a server task. This is kind of, it's almost like a, you could think about as a PLSQL kind of type of thing, right? So it means I can run some computation directly in the source of the data. Now, all the nodes are going to have this server task deployed. Then what is going to happen is uh, we've got this injector vertical. This is going to inject, well, it has already injected, about three weeks worth of data from the Swiss rail transport, which is about, 
I think about two, two and a half million entries. And then um, what we're going to do is in the front, we're going to use Jupiter. I think you, uh, some people have already talked about Jupiter. Uh, we're going to use Jupiter to kind of invoke an HTTP request onto our analytics vertical, which is going to invoke the delay calculator in one of the nodes. It doesn't matter which one. It's just going to choose one. And then this one then in turn is going to basically send it's going to then send the lambdas that it needs to do to calculate this to the other nodes and bring the data together and then reply. And then what we're going to do here in the end in Jupyter is we're just going to plot. Okay? We're going to plot to find out the answer. Is that, is that understood? Yeah. Okay. So let's get cracking. So uh, back to my... So... Oops. I'm not very good at this, am I? Um, so similar to before, before I go anywhere, I want to show you what the what it looks like at the moment. Right. So is that big enough? Yeah. So this is in my Jupyter notebook, w the way it looks at the moment. So what we have is we've got some uh, imports here. So we're gonna start executing one by one and see what happens. So we get the URL. And then the next one, at the moment, same as before, I'm kind of, I don't have yet things implemented. So the analytics that I'm going to get at the moment is, uh, if things are working, it should tell me zero because I don't have anything computed yet, okay? So we know things are, we don't have yet any analytics to show. Now, what do we need to do in this particular case? Here, um, what we're gonna concentrate on, um, is in something called the delay ratio task. This is the server task, which is our own server task is our own kind of thing, which you implement to basically be able to push it to the as a kind of as a task that runs within one of the nodes. Now here I'm doing a slightly different kind of if you looked before, before I was saying that I had I was trying to represent real-time data. So I was saying the real-time data is all these stations and then there are station boards. Here we're kind of looking at it in a slightly different way. I'm kind of looking at here are all the stop, all the kind of entries from station boards that I've collected over three weeks, right? So it's more like looking at as a way to store some historic data. Now, this two to know how many, to know what time of the day is the one where you get the biggest ratio of delay trains, I need to essentially calculate two ratios. I need to get per hour, so between midnight and one, between one and two, between one and three, how many trains are running through the entire system, and then out of those, how many are delayed. I mean, and basically with those two maps, I'll be able to de calculate the ratios. So how do we do that? Well, what we need to do is we can say, go to the values, so my stops, and I'm going to basically do some uh, stream processing. What I want to do is I want to collect them. I want to collect them in, in such a way that it tells me for between uh, midnight and one, this is one, two, three, number of counting. So it's a, this is like a group by. Um, the way we do is we can say collectors, which is a J JDK API, we can say group by. And then what do we need to group by? So for each stop, what we want to do, each stop has got something called departure timestamp. And then we're gonna get the hour of that. So if it's a if it's twelve fifteen, it's gonna be twelve. And then what we do then one is we say collectors counting. Okay. Uh, am I done? Yeah. Okay. Now this as is is not going to work exactly because one of the things I told you is that whatever we pass in into these streams needs to be serialized. Now this grouping by is Returning an object that is not serializable. Now, the way we can serialize it is very easy. Is this is a little trick that came with uh, Java? We can say serialize. I'm not going to serialize the object. I'm going to say serialize the function that produces that object. Okay, so it's kind of lazily, lazily computing it. This serialize here. What it takes advantage is that we can. So this um, um, function that you saw is a supplier, but we can say, hey. I can pass it on to this method, which takes a serializable supplier, and it will do the casting for us. So it's kind of like uh, it's a new trick that came with uh, Java 8. Now, okay, so we go the number of time uh, hours, uh, number of trains per hour. Now, what we need to do next is say, okay, 
I need the same thing, but I need how many of those are delayed? So I need to do some filtering to say stop, stop delay minutes bigger than zero. And then what I need afterwards is the same collect that I see here. Now, the thing here is that this lambda here, I don't need to do anything magic because that is already a lambda. So this filter that you see here, we've overridden it to kind of mark it as serializable in our own API. So here is a serializable predict uh, predicate, which is the same as, which is, uh, which in the standard API just takes predicate. Okay, so now we've already got the the streams, uh, the stream processing in in place. So what we need to do is we need to push these changes uh, to the to the container. So what we need to do is we need to uh, let's see. Oops, I think yeah, we need to go here and we need to do we need to basically build. Now. Um, Apart from building, what I need to do, I need to push this server task changes over to InfiniSpan. Uh, one way to do it, which is maybe not the most kind of cloud-friendly way, is to actually take the yard I've produced and push it to the container. This is something that we're trying to improve. Uh, there are other ways to do it with Kubernetes. You could have uh, persistent, uh, persistent volumes, I think it is. But um, we've actually got some uh, more, uh, we're working on some other improvements that basically don't require any of that. Um, so in my particular case, I'm just doing that for, for just ease of, uh, ease of the demo in here. And then the next thing that we need to do, OK, so our server has already got the server task. So what we need to do is see what happens when we execute now. So we get to here. So we the first two, we execute them. So now we get this is running a little bit slower than before because it's having to take all that data and run different nodes. So now. I'm getting 48. I know this is fine because I actually have got two maps of 24 hours. So I know in total I've got 48 entries. So now the question is, what is the time of the day where you get the most ratio of delayed trains? So let's plot it. We see th the biggest ratio is at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, can someone explain, can someone provide an answer why that is the case? We're talking about ratios. And? Yeah, but why, why would there be, delay? if there are less trains, you would imagine there would be, it would be the ratio. So I'll tell you a story. Um, the, the one time I was arriving into, uh, I was trying to get home. I live in Switzerland in a place called Neuchâtel. To get to Neuchâtel, there is d uh, direct trains up to certain hour, but after certain hour, the very last trains you have to stop in in Lausanne. So my train, uh, I came uh, so that I would pick very last connection I could get to my to my place, and then I was on the train and the train was delayed in Geneva, and I was on my way to Lausanne. I was like, oh my god, the train is delayed. I'm gonna miss my my train. I'm gonna be stuck in Lausanne. But one nice thing that happened in Switzerland is that the very last connections of the day wait for each other. So that means the moment there is one delay uh, in one of the uh, trains, it has a ripple effect. Basically, all of them get delayed because there are people waiting for connections. So thankfully, the other train waited for me for about, I don't know, it was like 15, 20 minute delay, and I was able to reach home. That is why you get like the biggest ratio. That's and then you see literally. So to so that you see the numbers. Let me show you the numbers at the beginning, because because uh, then you see what I'm talking about. Like at five o'clock, you got 113,000 trains running, out of which 5,000, 6,000 are delayed. But I'm two o'clock in the morning. Even 200, uh, oh, 300 out of two, three. This is a bigger proportion. And that is the reason, because once there is one delay, they wait for each other. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing to, to learn. Um, now, I think, as you see, uh, you can use some interesting analytics already with Java data streams. It's not, as I said, uh, Spark or things like that are more powerful. They have more features, um, so, but you can still do some, some interesting things. So it's a good, uh, good starting point. So. So that's all I had to say today. Um, 
So going back to what we say, we wanted to show you how to build an InfinSpan-based infrastructure that uh, you can use it to store, search, and process some near-time real data and calculate some analytics. We looked a little bit what were the challenges with uh, real-time data, which um, in some use cases it can be important. Um, we've looked at the uh, uh, all this exponential gr data growth that is happening. All of this data that I got is from uh, from Open Data API. So obviously people are pushing pushing more data. So it's interesting to work with those. Um, We've seen that the uh, continuous query can be used for dealing with real-time data. Um, one big caveat at the moment is we don't yet have, for example, wid windowing in our own continuous query, but we we kind of trying to work on that. So if you if you're interested in continuous query, but you want some kind of windowing, so like to say the last hour or whatever, then you've got things like a Spark and which are more kind of more broad APIs for dealing with that. Okay. Um, and then we've seen how you can do some analytics events with Java, Java streams. Um, to finish, just uh, thank these uh, people who allow me to use their, their logos. And all I've done today is in a public repo. It's in a public GitHub repository here. I've got instructions on how to run in. I've done a blog as well explaining how to go step by step, run these things, etc. So I really highly recommend that if you, this is of any interest of you, that you kind of go and give it a go. I think it's um, uh, I think it's very interesting and it's kind of quite quite cool. Uh, in this particular case, I've got like a brand called Early 2017. That's the one that I've been using today. Um, we've got some plans to further expand this demo. Um, if you want to know more about Infinispan, Infinispan.org and some links, OpenShift and Vertex. And yeah, if you like the talk, then just say something on Twitter. If you didn't like it, then say it as well. Might as well, right? Uh, so that's it. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So I have two roadmap questions. For the continuous queries, are you considering something like joins? Um, um, we are trying. Um, I think these, these joins uh, have been uh, something that we've been, uh, well, OK. I think there are I think there are some joins available already. But what we cannot do is if your data is split between different mm -hmm. two caches, I don't think we can join them yet. This has been something that uh, the guy, my colleagues that work on the query side have been looking at it, but uh, I not sh depending where your query is, your join is. But you can do if your station board had multiple fields, you can do a join between those. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for the for the analytics part, um, have you any success stories when it comes running simple graph algorithms on top of that analytics um, engine? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I couldn't say. I would uh, need to ask the, the guys whether they've done any graph calculations or... Mm -hmm. I, I don't know personally. Okay, I cool. couldn't say. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, Thank you. That was a great talk. And thanks. Everybody, thanks to the speaker, please.